In all of League of Legends, no league is quite like Europe. No one's as ready to laugh or as ready to meme. Trevor, <sighs> kiss me. Let <laughs> But Europe is different in another way, too. See what happens in this bottom lane, because SK Gaming, they do look like they're... <laughs> oh, hello, blue screen. <laughs> From the beginning, Europe's league lived in North America's shadow. But years of fighting, years of winning, have changed everything. It's fantastic. I love it. I love interacting with my North American colleagues and just being smug as f Hi, I'm Quickshot from the League of Legends European Championship, the LEC. It's the best league in the world. But are our teams any good? No, our teams are f great. Listen, we were kind of an NA copy for a while, then we kind of were testing a bunch of stuff. No, now we are going to be distinctly us again. It's going to be our style. Bam! You just got flexed on! Coming into LEC was the first year where we got to get like really wild, like really, really wild. And we were making weird stuff together. And that was the moment where I was like, if this continues, this is going to be like the greatest thing ever. Is this a bot lane? One that can challenge? Someone can push us? Someone with talent? Yo, this is Patrick. Just a little scare kid. Just picked up because no one tried to outbid. Come back in finals. We'll hit you twice. Might give you a game if we're nice. This is the LEC. And this is their story. League of Legends esports scene was taking off in a big way in 2012. Asia's dedicated servers had come online. A thriving North American and European scene competed against the world's best on a global tournament circuit. And by the end of the year, the best players in the world competed for the Summoner's Cup at a sold out Galen Center in LA. Season two, world finals begins right now. I present to you guys, the Summoner's Cup. Oh, God. We love the troll, we love the troll, right game, baby? Boom! Despite the success of League's young esports scene, Riot were looking to change things up. And in the beginning of 2013, they birthed two new esports leagues. But Riot did not necessarily treat their two broadcasts the same. Tons of damage. And it didn't take long for some differences between the siblings to emerge. The NALCS was produced in a new studio in Los Angeles that was built for the broadcast. It aired at prime time for both the West and East Coasts, but things were a little different in Europe. I think the team um, that worked together with Riot, like ESL and Riot, had been working on getting the EU LCS on the rails for a very long time. But me personally, I only got the call about two weeks before. And they said, well, can you be in Cologne in 10 days and then we'll do your first show in two weeks? And, and I was like, yes, let's do it. Yeah, I really, really rolled into it with no formal training whatsoever. And two weeks later, I was in front of the camera with a teleprompter doing a huge show, uh, which was quite the challenge. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ifya Shock Zaporter, and I'll be your host for the next 10 weeks as we kick off the League of Legends Championship Series live in HD from here in Cologne, Germany. The EU LCS operated out of ESL studio in Cologne, and unlike its NA sibling, it would be some time before Riot granted the league its own studio. In the opening years, it was very difficult because Riot had hired ESL as a third party. So any of the access, any of the tech, you know, it had to go through Riot. There was that extra uh, chopping block. So whenever we did have issues, it took a long time to resolve. Once like the servers just overheated and the show had to get moved to another day and we were all sent home, which was completely absurd. There were also multiple instances of the AC not working and there just being a suit top at the top and much like the work from home situation now, just shorts at the bottom, which then would make it to camera. I was on the analyst desk with D-Man at the time. We just finished the match introduction. We handed over to Joe Miller and Jason Kaplan. And after they got through picks and bands, they get into game and just a little drip started coming down. So we put a little bottle there and then the drip turned into a pour. And then the pour turned into a situation where we needed multiple buckets because the coolant had just started pouring down. 
Joe and Jason didn't break for a second. We didn't stop the broadcast, we didn't interrupt it. They had to cast looking through a bucket and we had to do everything in our power not to laugh because now you've got to do like tech support on a freaking, you know, AC unit. In those early days, there was a definite sense that everyone was still figuring things out. From the casters to the players to the support staff, the EU LCS brimmed with fresh excitement. The cool thing was that we were all kind of just doing our thing and learning along the way. And I think it was all kind of chill in the beginning. It was kind of about how we wanted to present the league and, and trying to do this insane thing, which nobody had done in esports, right? The weekly shows across NA and EU, that amount of games with the interviews and the whole show. So it was really cool to be part of all of that. From the beginning, parts of the EU LCS felt behind. Even airtime was an obstacle. The league would broadcast at challenging times for the European audience so that it didn't conflict with the NA stream. I did feel that in some years EU was kind of a guinea pig, but I think it's a constant push and pull because if you're the EU broadcast, you want the best for the EU viewers. If you're the NA broadcast, you want the best for the NA viewers and you don't want the EU to overlap and the other way around. As a team, as a broadcast, and even as a department that was working, there was jealousy and there was frustration. But it's really important to understand the context. When you launch a league like this that's never been done before and you're trying, you really are trying to redefine what a, a competitive esport can be, it's a difficult challenge. Europe's broadcast team didn't have all the toys their NA counterparts enjoyed, but still exciting things were happening in Germany. The inaugural spring and summer split showcased some of the best teams in the world and fans took notice. I'm Ifi Shog Zaporta, and once again we are broadcasting to you live from Cologne, Germany for day two of our LCS kickoff weekend. Are you guys ready? Under different banners, EG and Gambit had been two of the best teams in the world in 2012. Fnatic already had a world championship from the game's first season and they came roaring into the new year while perennial contenders SK nipped at their heels. Yeah, it was really a golden age for, I think, European League of Legends with the success that they've had internationally. I remember just a year before, we were actually convinced that Moscow 5 was going to win the whole thing, which unfortunately didn't happen. I think it was a time where we still believed that Europe or NA could win that world championship and, and the differences weren't that big and that really felt like an era of opportunity. In a time before Korea rose up to dominate League of Legends, Europe's first year of league play put the game's old monarchy into the spotlight. Each weekend, the best players in the world held court, and a new generation of talent was rising to challenge for the throne. Bjergsen is going to kill Virtual though. Freddy going low. Nigod Bro going low. No, no, he's finished off. Karalias and Freddy are the only two men left alive here. God Bro is still somehow alive in this one as he flings Freddy away again. Can we see a a kill? Can he get the Penta kill here? Bjergsen chasing down. Oh, he's missing just about, but they're Give through. It to a Penta kill! As League's global popularity grew into 2014, fans began to have less and less patience for the production issues that had been known to plague either. ESL streams, and the EU LCS's production was quickly becoming a meme. From a full combo of the SK team. See what happens in this bottom lane because SK Gaming, they do look like they're. <laughs> oh, hello, blue screen. <laughs> well, I'm... we can still see what's going on, luckily. So, thought about going for a fight, but they didn't actually engage in the right, end. Right. Nobody actually got the kills. Ooh, we didn't see Frog and leaving the game, so we're going to have a boss. Uh oh! <laughs> Wow. It's always good to see that. Oh yeah. Well, it's, it's not a blue screen this We're time. We're back, guys! <laughs> Hello! In 2014, Riot moved its production from the ESL Studios to a multi-studio space owned by a local TV company. But even as a new wave of promising young players began to emerge, it was hard to move the conversation past the production hiccups. I was reading all of the EU production treads and all of the flame constantly. I think the nature of being one of the on-air talent crew is that when something goes wrong, people are gonna write to you on Twitter and on Reddit and on Instagram and everything. I remember distinctly that there was a really, really kind of negative atmosphere sometimes amongst us casters because we were, we were dragged down by all of that because you think every day you show up all these cool people behind the scenes were gonna make an amazing show and then something goes wrong and public opinion just 
is again against you. And it felt so bad because we wanted to make such a good show. So what was really difficult at the time was that A, I was trying to prove myself as a caster and B, I was being labeled as the person that was causing the problems, whether it was my fault or not. There was a lot of negative fallout that fell on the shoutcaster's shoulders because fans just didn't understand yet. By 2015, it was time for a change. The EU LCS moved from Cologne to Berlin, Riot took over production from ESL, and for the first time ever, the biggest games in Europe would be played from a studio specifically built for the purpose. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to day one of the 2015 European League of Legends Championship Series, coming to you live from our brand new home here in Berlin, Germany. I, for one, cannot believe it that I'm on this side of the... 2015? The opening season, the opening show, was the scariest show that I have ever done to date. We were terrified. It was a new setup, new staff, new studio, new camera guys, new producers, uh, new roles. It was like hitting the reset button. And 2015 proved to be a banner year for a league now filled to the brim with a new generation of European talent. By Fnatic not going to the bottom main, they allowed him to get the farm, but that opened up for the Baron for them, so honestly, it was just... Oh, wow, they he knew! knew. It the entire time, and Froggen, he looks like he's going down. That's Febivin. The last tick of Ignite, they take the tower as well. It was Froggen all along who was baited. In a year that showcased the height of Korea's powers, MSI and World saw Europe prove to everyone they could still go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best. Here we go. Here, we go. Here comes Huni. Fake is knocked up. Hourglass comes out. Yellowstone rain over. Are the only ones caught by the glacial prison. Faker in retreat. Huni throws down the onslaught of shadows, and the equalizer will at least dissuade Fnatic's aggression. Huni on the full back off, and Fnatic are somewhat split. They are going to find Bang though, as a multi-man knocker from Wolf will slow things down, but ultimately not affect the outcome. Rain over sinks his fangs into Faker. They buy a bit of time. Another couple of kills cut through, and Stake has nowhere to go. A few more shots will do it. Oh, boom! The kills come in. And this could be the semifinals for Origin. There's only one man left alive. This will surely be the base. And Europe has a semifinals in the World Championship as Origin with 3 to 1. And along with its players, Europe's casting talent were beginning to cement their personalities and put their own stamps on the league. Defishu and I planned and promoted and doubled down on the synergy that we had. There was just a chemistry that, that you, you, can't, you can't explain. Martin had the strangest sense of humor and the ability to just surprise everyone. Uh, it was Martin that turned to me and said, kiss me, Trevor. Let's see what other awards they have. I would have liked to pink or two more from Unicorns of Love. They have to go for it. <laughs> Trevor, <sighs> kiss me. Let <laughs> Um, it was Martin that said, off air during an ad break, when we come back, maybe you should spank me. And welcome back to European LCS. We're getting into game three, as Deficio and I are excited for this one. Now, I didn't anticipate that I was going to hit him so hard. Uh, it actually, like, really threw him off, right? But, like, you know, he just had a really great sense for being an entertainer and in a fairly wholesome way and, and just very genuine. Um, but, yeah, we definitely, we promoted it, we, we pushed it. Uh, to the point that he got someone to photoshop his face onto my wife on my wedding day. But 2016 brought a new challenge for the EU LCS along with a new format. Over the next two years, the league experimented with a best of two format, then a best of three format that was spread across multiple streams. And despite the competitive benefits of a much longer regular season that mirrored Korea's LCK and China's LPL, the broadcast struggled to keep the Western audience's attention. I firmly believe, this is a very personal opinion, that the move to BO3 just did not suit our audience. And it did not suit the interest and the ability to watch for European and North American viewers. Viewership declined, and despite a studio broadcast that mirrored its North American sibling, the EU LCS struggled to carve out an identity for itself. I had the impression that it was just not working the way it used to. Um, you do something or a segment or a show and you get barely any interaction or Twitter or you didn't get the feeling that anyone was really interested with what was going on, which in your mind is always bigger than it actually is. Viewership dictates whether or not we have jobs, but I will always be thankful that here in Europe, our leadership team, no matter where it was, whether it was ESL or whether it was here in Berlin, 
always to just make the best show you can. Our producers and our managers were the ones that needed to worry about viewership and they never stressed us out with that. But we're not stupid, right? This is a free broadcast and it's a free game. So if we don't have viewership, the thought crosses, like what does this mean? It seemed like Europe was destined to live in North America's shadow in more ways than one. Something else that's really important to understand is that up until 2017, North America produced our show. We piped all of our camera feeds and our player feeds and audio and, and everything to Santa Monica. They then cut it all together, piped it back to us to Shoutcast, and we piped it back to them and then they broadcast it. We had a special internet connection called Dark Fiber. And at the beginning of every show day, we'd find out how many strands of Dark Fiber do we have. I believe at the time we had three or four and there'd be show days where they're like, guys, we're down to one dark fiber. Like if this goes down, we lose everything. And heading into 2018, it looked like North America was pulling ahead again. The new NALCS would get a massive injection of money and resources. North America already had a history of importing players from around the world, and English-speaking Europeans were a favorite target, which presented a unique problem for the EU LCS. Massive contracts from NA teams threatened a talent drain that some fans worried could cripple Europe once and for all. Europe had a choice to make. They could stay the course and risk another year of declining viewership, or they could take some risks. And so the broadcast started to change and push some boundaries. And the avatar of this new wave of comedy was Vedius and his dozens of personalities. Welcome, my dudes, to another episode of Picks to Watch. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs, et bienvenue dans une nouvelle de episode in Picks to Watch. Humor was weird for us. Like, we wanted to branch out, but I think that how it ended up working, essentially, was Vettius just started pitching weird stuff. I can't really give him enough credit here, because he, he was at the end of the day, the catalyst that kind of kicked off, I think, the sense of humor that like you see on LEC today. Because I think that for the most part, if you had worked at Riot for a while, it was really hard to break out of the mindset of like, this is esports professionalism. It's really hard to break out of that. But he, bless his heart, is just so unashamedly himself. And so he started pitching weird stuff. And so Vettius isn't like the, the sole mastermind behind this, but by being the kind of person that no matter what else has like come before, no matter what the context, he's always willing to like put himself out there and pitch this wild stuff. It really like kicked off everyone's creativity. But that was like, that was really the big change. And that was really the big moment where I think the goofier tone for broadcast specifically, you know, started to carry through. Thank you, Shocks. Hello everyone. I'm Daniel Dracos, joined by Martin DeFischer-Lunga. What a glorious intro. What's as glorious as it ever is, my yeah. friend. Beautiful beard, again. Thank you. Thank I you. like it. I wish I could get one. Yeah, I'm glad you can't. can't. It's the only thing that makes me unique. But before we get into Champions Select, <laughs> let's check out the lineup. That's very sad. <laughs> look at that Look at that head tilt from Jazuke. That, that's what you need. Just that. Look at that suit from Yamada Cannon. Oh my. We look so bad compared oh to it. Oh, God. For years, Europe had quietly done what it did best cultivate talent. Their systems bred prodigal mid laners, historic leaders, and mechanical masters that stood on top of the world. But the scene had also been developing personalities on the casting desk. And by 2018, a fully autonomous EU LCS was unleashing those personalities and setting them free. Thank you, uh, Fischio, for joining us as well. Why is this guy here? I, I'm not sure what just happened. <laughs> Let me hold your hand. Like first. he's just, <laughs> please. Well, there we go. Now I'm here to support you because Trevor is mean. I'm the good guy. The amount of relief and freedom that it gave us was palpable, but it was also terrifying. We forever lived in the shadow of NALCS. And again, from a business perspective, it made sense, right? It sucked not having similar tools or similar broadcast capabilities. And it was very, very challenging in the, the early days being forced to work on multiple time zones and not having you know, the teams and departments on the ground. So once we got to 2018 and we were fully autonomous in, in 2018, again, it was exhilarating and it was really, really fun that we were in control of our own destiny. And after being told for years that certain things just weren't possible, after dealing with cross-continental production hiccups, 2018 was the year that Europe's league broke away and found its identity. 
Ladies and gentlemen of Denmark, in the Royal Arena, put your hands together for the Spring Split Finals! The most important thing, I think, was that distinct feeling of, listen, we were kind of an NA copy for a while, then we kind of were testing a bunch of stuff. No, now we are going to be distinctly us again. We're going to be serious, of course, and professional, but it's going to be our style and our way of doing things. And listen, we're going to do very silly things sometimes that are not going to work out, but that's fine. And that was a really fun time to be part of uh, the EU LCS. Welcome to Berlin and week five of the EU LCS Spring Split. We have to talk about the Deficio faces in the crowd. There's actually a bus of about 60 fans that drove all the way from Denmark to attend the show. So shout out to them. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Martin Deficio Lunger, joined by Martin Deficio Lunger, Pulsar, Denmark, Copenhagen, all those good things. Who is going to end the game? Tigers wants to bring it in. Ruin goes down. What is this? Oh my god, H2K, that is fucking beautiful. But then you can take a carry down. Back, flash, nah, what a stack of white knight. And changes weren't just happening on the broadcast. Our European teams started to step up on the international stage. I think something that's really important to, to recognize is that more of the world will watch when your team performs against the world. 2v1, Proxim may have been up more than he can shoot. The health card's running down. The kick, the Q, the second! Get out. That was gorgeous! And now it's oh. time for the turret to fall, as Valwan drops as well. 5v4, only the Nexus has defense itself as Duke pops the stopwatch, but he's sure to go down. The knockup and a double kill for Cap. The kick back for Proxa, make it three, and a five versus one. Jackie Love versus the world, and he simply cannot do it. And Fnatic will fall Invictus. They will take the number one seed into the quarterfinal. Worlds 2018 saw Korea's dominance in League of Legends finally come to an end. And though China rose up as the new top region, Europe's best teams were right behind them. And they rode that momentum into 2019. We felt like we were doing a lot of very good things. We felt like we built a fantastic foundation and we were getting consistently impressive viewership. Our teams were performing both locally and internationally and the fan base was resonating with the changes we were making. But we were still tarnished with the little brother, little sister syndrome. We had the same name. The comparisons to NA and EU were frustrating and sort of unjustified. Who would win? Is it 100 Thieves or Rogue? This debate has raised. Hey, on. You're on a win streak, I'll have you know. In North America, it's <laughs> on a win streak, it's I'll have you know. It's true, he's got a great point. They beat man. Cloud9. Uh, yeah, so Cloud9 is bad as well. No. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. NALCS and the EU LCS were identical in many ways. They were constantly compared. And Europe at that time was sort of viewed as the, the little sister of NA. And we wanted to take the opportunity when we launched the long-term partnership of what we now know as the LEC to find our own voice and to kind of break away from that comparison. How can we capture that voice and capture that uniqueness that really is truly European? The logo itself has a few aspects built into it. The first is this kind of upwards explosion. We kind of looked at building the form from. The second is that you can see that the logo is two parts. And that really is a nod to the two different teams coming together to do battle. But in the end, it's one thing. And that one thing uh, stands for the victor. Um, it also is shaped like a crown, but also because it's quite dimensional, it feels a bit like an arena. There's this negative space and you almost feel like you can walk into that as well. So three singular things is what we kind of built into this overall symbol in the end. The outcome that we wanted to get from our audience was to feel something that they were proud of, feel like this was unique to Europe, to feel excited, energetic, to feel related to the brand. When you watch the live stream, for example, that you would just feel this energy that we were trying to convey. We have this opportunity to really create something special with the launch of this long-term partnership. Let's make a brand that really represents what we think our fans really stand for. 2019 was the beginning of a new era for Europe. Long-term partnerships with teams, a revamped studio, and a broadcast team that was given free range to experiment and make the kind of content they wanted to. 
Rotterdam, what is your region? Why did you break up with Quickshot for Peke? I'm going to put it out there. I Trevor, <sighs> kiss me. Le- <laughs> I want the LEC back so I can stand in the chat. I want the LEC back in my life. Twenty nineteen coming into LEC was the first year where we got to get like really wild. Like really, really wild. And that was the biggest change because producers that I had worked with for years suddenly like no longer had to make like generic pro player documentaries or interviews. And we were making weird stuff together. And that was the moment where I was like, if this continues, this is gonna be like the greatest thing ever. God bless Dennis who's sitting here with us now and Margot, the other producer that I work with very frequently who can make these visions come to life. Like I'm so, I'm so lucky. Like I can tell Dennis some really dumb stuff and Dennis can go, oh yeah, we can make that work. And then Dennis has to do all the work. And then people go, wow, another, another good one from Dracos. Hey, Vetti, what? You really think you need help with this fool? Are you kidding me? He can't even cast the world's quarterfinal. Like, are you serious? In the meantime, please enjoy getting smacked up by Myth. I see the cracks in the surface. I know your flex picks are worthless. You know your empire's about to expire. You know that you do have to serve this. So try another verse. Go and try another this. You can take a shot at the queen, but you best not miss. I think the rap battles were one of the most successful things to come out of that first year for sure. I think they were kind of emblematic of that we were willing to do everything, you know? And I remember distinctly it was an idea that came from Dracos and Vedius. Dracos, who by the way is like the driving force from the talent side behind a lot of the creative ideas. I listen to a lot of rap, but I don't think I'm a very good rapper and it showed. You know, I think everyone's like, yeah, sure, I can rap. How hard can it be? Let me tell you, it is super difficult. We can't hide the fun we're having with everything that we're making, and I think that's what grips people that are watching it as well. Rap battles were an interesting thing. It's like there's no way that this turns out not horribly cringy and bad beyond belief. I think it was like 95% me with Vettius being like, ooh, we could, we could shit talk this, or we could shit talk that, and we could shit talk that, and that was kind of his contribution. It's a great thing, and it's a yeah, collaborative effort of Vettius pushing me to get out of my comfort zone, and me pushing Vettius to not make cringy stuff. And Europe's teams were experiencing something of a renaissance themselves. A revamped G2 Esports rose to the forefront of International League of Legends in 2019, taking an MSI title and second place at Worlds. The perks is coming in. This is his hero moment. If he wants to turn this fight in favor of team, this could be the game. He gets the fight up. moment. Vader is gone. Teddy's next on the list. There's no way he can duel Yasuo. Amon is coming in, but he's just walking into the meat grinder of perks. Con, can he do it? Perks. They've done enough. They've done it. They're gonna win. G2. Con, can he get it done? He can't. The Vladimir. They can't do it. They this is it! The greatest team in the history of League of Legends taken down by the greatest team Europe has ever produced! It is going to be looked back on in history as a, a turning point, as a watershed moment. It's fantastic. On, on a completely selfish level, I love it. I love interacting with my North American colleagues and just being smug as f European fans, once again, are now used to seeing some of these teams really do well. I'm missing a region here that didn't get that far. Um, I'm trying to remember... They're not really relevant no, right now, no, so not really. we should just stick to the European stuff, and I think that's fine. We know our teams are going to show up, we know that they're going to perform, and we know that the ecosystem will produce rookies and new players that will replace our old ones. We got really lucky that in 2018, when everything started to change, and 2019 that we had some of the best international results we have ever had. You know, three European teams out of groups, two times back-to-back -back world final, an MSI winner? Where are we? You know, that was so crazy. And G2 will pull back. That's a big stun! That's a big engage! Oh my gosh, look at the fight! They look for kill number four. This might be an ace inside of the base. There is no chance TL comes back from this. They're already on to the Nexus turrets. This is what peak League of Legends looks like, and it comes from Europe. A world record. G2 Esports 3-0 will win MSI 2019. 
Of course, that combination of factors was amazing. We were so thankful for it because, you know, if you're gonna be a part of a region that's doing well and people wanna see and people believe in and the broadcast is great, so you get to shine in all kinds of different forms of content and like bring more of yourself out there, I think you're gonna be much happier as a player as well. In order to become a champion, one must become the champion. Forward, Broxa, become one with Nunu. Run the snowball to victory. Come, Broxa, you must land the snowballs in order to win! 2020 brought its own challenges, with remote play and almost an entire split of remote broadcasting during the COVID-19 pandemic. How are we all uh, feeling? It's a fine moment. I ate chicken with uh, potatoes and with two eggs from our chef. It was really good. Wait, two eggs? I only had one egg. It was one big egg, but two egg yolks. We are minutes away from the LEC Spring Split Finals. Europe, who will win the title? Europe, your seven-time champions. G2 Esports, you can see perks there, lifting the trophy. Jankos, our split MVP. Of course, they came from the trophy lift. Test, test, Jankos, can you hear me? Oh, no, I don't think your mic set. It's fine. Well, wait, you can hear me probably, but I think maybe your mic settings aren't good yet. Maybe we have to plug it in. Well, now we can try to hear me, right? Oh. Hello? Yes. <laughs> oh, um. Shall I ask sorry? you a question? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. I, I didn't realize. I mean, I was like, no, okay, okay. oh, my body is <laughs> I love the way they're able to play around. <laughs> <laughs> what even is that? <laughs> And maybe, in another time, that chaotic season would have crippled the league. Maybe once upon a time, amid plummeting viewership and dwindling international results, the LEC couldn't have weathered the pandemic. But things had changed. Europe had grown up, and it was strong. Your favorite jersey, order your favorite snack. And these times are tough, we know it. Now it all comes down to this every dream and every wish. Now it all comes down to this. Now it all comes down to this. So, chat, we've got a step for you. We are. In the earliest days of League of Legends, Europe was an undeniable international powerhouse. But times change, League of Legends changed, and eventually, the old kings were dethroned. But Europe didn't fade away. Europe's teams were on the rise, their production was in full swing, and fans were finally gifted the league that always could have been. The league they'd seen tiny glimpses of, always on the horizon. Hi, I'm Quickshot from the League of Legends European Championship. The LEC. It's the best league in the world. But are our teams any good? No. Our teams are f***ing great. Its teams, its players, its broadcasters kept working, kept chasing a dream they knew could be real. Come watch the best League of Legends content in the world. Week in and week out. We are the League of Legends European Championship. This is the LEC. And we're back. I've been doing this now for since 2013, right? And I distinctly remember the shows that we did in spring of this year, of 2020. There were a couple of weeks where I just was so excited and I, I hadn't had that feeling necessarily for a few years because I always loved doing the show. But that is something that really hit me. I think it was the first time that it really dawned on me since maybe 2017 that all our hard work has paid off, is paying off, and uh, we're making a show that people are excited to watch as much as we are excited to make it. The LEC was no longer a carbon copy of NA. It was something new, something different, and it seemed that everyone on the continent was flourishing, that everyone was having fun. It really felt like that clean start that like, I think everyone wanted. I didn't realize it at the time, but it was so much of the baggage and so much of like 
the politics of the EU LCS versus NA LCS just like kind of washing away that really felt like we got to be our own broadcast team and like whatever shit we had dealt with in years past kind of just faded away for a lot of people in that preseason. Today, the LEC is everything its founding members could have hoped for and more. Europe's teams contend with the best players in the world, and its league is free to be uniquely itself. In the end, Europe knew it would never regain its kingdom by sitting passively by while the rest of the world raced ahead. The people there knew they would have to fight for everything they got.